Welcome to this free legal clinic provided by the First Judicial District Court, private attorneys, and the Santa Fe Community College Legal Studies Program. This free legal clinic is offered once a month by the First Judicial District Court, by private attorneys who volunteer their time to help people who can't afford a lawyer, and by the Santa Fe Community College Legal Studies Program. The clinic is designed to give you general information about divorce and parentage cases. You'll learn something about the legal process involved in divorce and child custody cases, as well as the practical aspects of them. We'd like to thank the film program at the Santa Fe Community College for their very generous support in this important endeavor. Welcome to the First Judicial District Court. I'm Judge Raymond Ortiz, the Chief Judge in this district. Although the vast majority of cases on my current docket are civil cases, for approximately four and a half years I was the presiding judge in family court, during which time approximately 12,000 cases were assigned to my docket. So I have some familiarity and knowledge concerning the type of case that you're involved with at the current time. On the basis of that knowledge, and familiarity, it became very clear to me very early on uh, during the time I was the presiding judge in family court that most litigants represented themselves and most had little or no knowledge and experience concerning the law and procedures that were applicable to their cases. Uh, on the basis of that, we are hoping to provide you with some additional information concerning the law and procedures applicable to your case. Please understand that judges and court staff cannot under any circumstances give you any legal advice about the specifics of your case. However, we are permitted to provide you with some general information that we hope you will provide, find useful during the time that you're in our court. Perhaps you already have the general information packet uh, that you've been able to obtain from our litigation assistance center. That packet contains some information and some forms which we hope you will find helpful. Uh, as you file your case uh, and move your case through to conclusion in our court. The purpose of the presentation here today is to provide you with some additional information to help you understand those forms, understand those instructions, and help you to provide some additional information that we think you will uh, find very useful uh, to move your case through to conclusion. Please pay very close attention to the information that we'll be providing you here today. There is uh, quite a lot of ground to cover and we have to move very quickly uh, to cover that ground, so we will be uh, covering uh, quite a lot of territory here. Again, please remember uh, that we cannot give you legal advice. We can only give you general information about the status of your case uh, and about how to move your case uh, through uh, our rather complex system. If at the, beginning, if at the conclusion of this presentation uh, you think you're going to need some additional legal advice, by all means, please consult with an attorney. Again, welcome to our court. Now that you have a family law case pending in our district, this is now your court as well. In this clinic, you will receive general information about divorce and paternity cases, so you can learn about the legal process and the practical aspects of preparing to represent yourself in such cases. The first thing you need to know is that a divorce or a parentage case or custody disputes are lawsuits. One party sues the other in a court of law and asks the judge to make decisions for them. Courts are governed by rules. There are rules that dictate how the case will proceed. These are called the rules of civil procedure. There are other rules that determine what information the judge can hear and how it can be presented. These are called the rules of evidence. Judges try cases. They listen to the evidence and arguments that each side offers. The process is called a trial. Then the judge makes a decision based on the evidence and arguments. Courts are intended to be fair and impartial, and the rules are one of the ways that happens. Another way is by making sure that neither side has a chance to talk to the judge privately without the other side and a court reporter being present to make a record of everything that's said. You can never talk to the judge about your case without the other side being present. If you are representing yourself, you are both your own lawyer and your own client. You will be assumed to know both the law and procedures as they apply to your case. You will be expected to be familiar with and follow the rules of civil procedure and rules of evidence. 
The rules of civil procedure and the rules of evidence limit what information can be presented to the judge and how that information is presented. There are no special rules for self-represented people. The same rules that apply to lawyers apply to you. Court employees, even if they are lawyers, cannot give you legal advice about your particular situation. Paralegal students and paralegals are also prohibited from giving legal advice, since they aren't lawyers. But the volunteer attorney here today may be able to answer some questions for you after this presentation. Second thing you should know is that 90 plus percent of cases are resolved by settlement, not by trial. People involved in a lawsuit almost always need some help from a neutral third party to be able to work out a settlement. The court has two different programs that offer this kind of help. I'll get to that a little later. The process of settling cases with the help of a neutral third party is referred to as Alternative Dispute Resolution, or ADR. The process is an alternative to trial, the process that's used to resolve cases by a judge. ADR offers many benefits to the parties. Studies show that it costs less, takes less time, provides better certainty of the outcome, and even helps to improve the relationship between the parties, something that's particularly important when parties have children together. I know that right now, the last thing you probably want to think about is negotiating with the other side. But especially if you have children, I can't encourage you enough to start thinking about how you might be able to work together to settle your case instead of having the judge do it for you. Settling your case is the only way to have a predictable outcome that you can control. It's possible that the resolution may not be 100% satisfactory, but it reduces the risk of the judge making a decision that affects you most negatively. Be settled. You have the right to accept or reject settlement offers all the way up until the time the judge issues an order. For instance, if part of your agreement is that your mother will provide childcare at certain times, that may be the thing that makes the whole agreement work. But the judge doesn't have the power to order someone who isn't a party to the lawsuit in front of him or her, like your mother, to do anything. You are strongly encouraged to start the negotiating process as early as possible. Resolving your case sooner rather than later is usually in everyone's best interests, and the court's own process is set up to help you do this. I want to be clear, though, that not every case can or should be settled. You have the right to accept or reject settlement offers all the way up until the time the judge issues an order. Now I want to talk a little bit about the services the First Judicial District Court offers to help you with your case. The court's self-help center is staffed from 8 to 12 and 12.30 to 4.30, Monday through Friday, by a court employee who can provide forms and procedural information. The self-help center staff cannot fill out the forms for you or tell you what to put in the blanks, but she can explain the forms to you so that you understand what information is required. Most forms are free. You can also buy packets of forms for divorces and parentage cases for $10 at the self-help center. The forms packets have the forms you'll need to fill out and file to finalize your case, as well as general information and instructions for each form. The packets and many other forms are also available free on the court's website, which is www.firstdistrictcourt.gov under the heading Forms. The court has a lot of other information on its website, too. You can look up any case using a case number or a party's name in Case Lookup. And a lot of the information in this clinic can be found by clicking on the button if you don't have a lawyer. There are a minimum of three forms required in a divorce case. Every divorce starts with a petition for dissolution of marriage. All divorce cases also require a marital settlement agreement that identifies and divides property and debt. The final decree of dissolution of marriage is a court order that legally ends the marriage. You are not divorced until the final decree is signed by the judge and filed with the court. As we've already mentioned, every divorce case is started by filing a petition for dissolution of marriage. 
A parentage case is started by filing a petition to establish paternity, determine custody and time sharing, and assess child support. In divorces with children under 18 years of age and in parentage cases, you will also have to complete and file a parenting plan that describes how the two of you are going to take care of your children. If you have minor children, you will be ordered to attend an information session at the courthouse. They are held on the first and third Thursdays every month from 3 to 5 p.m. At the information session, you'll get information about how the divorce may affect your children and what you can do to reduce its effect. You will also get information about how to schedule an appointment with a mediator to develop a parenting plan if the two of you need help with that. What is mediation? Both parents sit down with a trained, experienced, neutral third party to try to work out a plan that's good for the children and that both parents can live with. The mediators at Family Court Services are not lawyers. They cannot give you legal advice and they can't represent you in court. But the Family Court Services mediators are experienced in family law cases and can help you and your spouse talk to each other and work out your own agreements about how to take care of your children. Parents of children under 18 are also required to file a child support worksheet. You can calculate child support online by using the interactive child support worksheet on the New Mexico Supreme Court's website, www.nmcourts.gov. Click on Family Law Forms, then click on Child Support Worksheet and follow the instructions. If you and your spouse can't work this out on your own, you can get help through a court service called Settlement Facilitation. This process is similar to mediation. You file a request for referral to Settlement Conference. The case is referred to a settlement facilitator who is a lawyer trained in mediation techniques. You and your spouse meet with a settlement facilitator and work out an agreement to divide the property and debts. The parties pay the settlement facilitator $500 plus tax for a settlement conference of up to four hours. Usually, each party pays half of the fee. If you feel you can't afford the fee, you can file a request for free or reduced fee settlement facilitation services. The form is available at the Self-Help Center and on the court's website. How are settlement facilitation and mediation similar? Mediators and settlement facilitators are neutral third parties whose role is to help the parties craft their own solutions. Mediators and settlement facilitators do not represent or advise either party. Mediators and settlement facilitators are not judges they do not make decisions for you or tell you what to do. What is the difference between mediation and settlement facilitation? Mediators are trained to help people talk to each other, but they do not evaluate the case or suggest solutions. Settlement facilitators, because of their legal training, can help each party evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of their own and the other side's case, and they may take a more active role than mediators in encouraging both sides to come up with possible solutions. But settlement facilitation and mediation are both out-of-court ways to resolve the issues in your case. They're different from a court order because judges may only hear information allowed by the rules of civil procedure and the rules of evidence. You can talk about all aspects of your case with the other party and a mediator or settlement facilitator. And you can come up with more creative solutions than a court might have the authority to impose. By attending this clinic, you can get a voucher for a free half-hour consultation with a private attorney. You should pick only one or two issues that you need help with. Since it's only a half hour, you must be prepared and organized. Bring all the supporting information for the issue that you want to talk about. Your attendance here today qualifies you for one voucher. If you want one, see one of the organizers of the clinic after the program. There are several sources of free legal help from lawyers for people who meet income requirements. New Mexico Legal Aid offers free legal advice and occasionally is able to provide representation. Law Access New Mexico offers free legal advice over the phone. Their phone number is 1-800-340-9771. 
and you can find them on the web at www.lawaccess.org. The New Mexico Family Legal Assistance Group provides legal advice and forms assistance over the phone in divorce, parentage, domestic violence, landlord-tenant, and consumer and small claims cases. Their phone number is 505-256-0417. They also have a website with a lot of useful information at www.nmflag.org. The New Mexico Child Support Enforcement Division can also help you with paternity cases and with child support at no charge. Call them at 1-800-288-7207, 1-800-288-7207, or find them online at www.hsd.state.nm. Dot us slash csed. Child Support Enforcement offers full child support services which include finding absent parents and their employers and or assets, establishing paternity if necessary, and establishing and enforcing child support orders. They also will take care of collecting child support payments from one parent through payroll deductions and paying them to the other parent. CSED has powers that no one else has. For example, they can intercept tax returns for child support. Keep in mind, though, that CSED represents the state, not the individual. They're not your lawyer, they're the state's lawyer. The judge has to have jurisdiction of your case before he or she has the authority to make any decisions. Jurisdiction is the right and power of a judge to hear and determine a legal proceeding. There are two kinds of jurisdiction, subject matter and personal. Subject matter jurisdiction is the authority of the court to hear a particular kind of case. The state trial courts, like the First Judicial District Court in Santa Fe, are courts of general jurisdiction. Divorces and parentage cases are general jurisdiction cases, and therefore, the First Judicial District Court has the authority to hear these cases. Personal jurisdiction is the authority of the court to make decisions that affect a person. Whether a judge has jurisdiction to hear and decide your case depends more on you than on the judge or the court as a whole. If both of you have lived in this judicial district for six months or longer, there's no question about whether the court has personal jurisdiction. But if one of you does not or never has lived in this district, or if one or both of you is an enrolled member of an Indian tribe, there may be other courts that would also have jurisdiction over your case. A related matter is venue. Venue means the actual place where a case is heard. The first judicial district has courthouses in Santa Fe, Tierra Amarillo, and Los Alamos counties. If you live in one of these counties, you can file your case in this district court. If you live in another county, you'll file your case in a different district court. Every divorce case starts by filing a petition for dissolution of marriage. A parentage case is started by filing a petition to establish paternity, determine custody and time sharing, and assess child support. The first paragraphs in either petition identify the parties and state the reasons why the court has jurisdiction. It's required that this information be included in these petitions. When two people get married, a new legal entity or person is created, the community. The community is like a business partnership. The two partners are the husband and the wife. Each partner has an undivided one-half interest in the community. Many people have heard of community property. Now I'll explain what community property means under the law. With some exceptions, the community owns all property acquired during the marriage, including income earned from either spouse's labor. The salaries and wages of the husband and the wife, including benefits like retirement, that are earned during the marriage belong to the community, and each person owns one half of all of it. This means that if one spouse works outside the home and the other one doesn't, 
One half of the income earned by the working spouse is owned by the non-working spouse. It also means that if one spouse works for an employer who has a retirement plan, one half of the value of the retirement plan that is accrued during the marriage belongs to the other spouse. Debts acquired during the marriage also belong to the community, and each party is responsible for paying them off. Except for real estate and gambling debts, either party can commit the community to a debt without the agreement or knowledge of the other person. If one party charges up the credit cards without the knowledge and agreement of the other one, both of them will be responsible for paying them off. The presumption is that all property and debt acquired during the marriage belongs to the community. There are some circumstances where property and debt acquired during a marriage may be the separate property or debt of one party. The husband and wife may also have separate property or separate debts. Separate property is property acquired before the marriage or during the marriage by gift, inheritance, agreement of the parties, or through the proceeds of the sale of separate property. Separate debts are like separate property. They may have been acquired before the marriage or during the marriage if certain legal agreements were made about the debt. Gambling debts of one party are also considered separate debts. Separate property remains separate, but it should be identified as separate. Sometimes property gets mixed up. It's not uncommon, for instance, for one spouse to inherit land or a house, and then the two of you move into it and fix it up using community funds. Or sometimes the reverse happens. The two of you buy a house together, and then one of you inherits money and uses it to improve the house you own together. When you divorce, there may be issues about how much of the value of the property belongs to each party. If there are separate property issues, you may need an attorney to help sort out what should belong to which party. This is an issue you can bring to the free attorney consultation with a voucher from this class. When you divorce, your community and separate property and debts have to be identified and assigned to one or the other of you. When community property and debt are being divided, the rule is that each party is entitled to or responsible for half. Sometimes this is pretty simple. Maybe each of you has a job and you each earn roughly the same amount. You have two credit cards, each with a similar balance. You have two cars and owe about the same amount on each. You don't have any other property or debts. So each of you takes one car and one credit card and you're done. But more often, there's disparity in the amount of income of each party or in the amount of debt. Trying to figure out how to divide property and debts can be very difficult. You can try to work things out on your own. If you need help, you can file a request for referral to settlement conference to get help through the court's ADR program that was described before. To divide property and debts, you complete a marital settlement agreement. The marital settlement agreement is a contract between the two members of the community, you and your spouse, that disposes of the property and the debts the two of you have acquired during the marriage. But the two of you are the only parties to the contract. It does not affect any contractual relationship the two of you may have with any outside party, such as a creditor. One thing you need to know is that when you divide debt, especially debts like credit cards, your agreement about who will be responsible for paying that debt only applies to the two of you. The credit card company will still look to whichever spouse they think can pay, regardless of what your marital settlement agreement says. If your agreement is that you will take the MasterCard and your spouse will take the Visa and your spouse doesn't pay the Visa, Visa will still come after you for payment. There is an indemnity provision in the marital settlement agreement that says, if this happens, you can sue your spouse to make him or her pay you back. Of course, that won't fix your credit rating that may have been damaged by your spouse's failure to pay. Usually, the only way to get one person's name off a credit card account that the other person is responsible for is to pay off the account. Then sometimes a credit card company will take the other person's name off, or sometimes they'll close the account and you'll have to reapply for another account in your name only. Mortgage companies are like credit card companies. They usually won't take one person's name off a mortgage that both of you applied for, 
unless the person who wants to keep the property that's mortgaged is able to refinance in their own name. Another thing you need to know about property and debt division is that the marital settlement agreement does not transfer title to a car, land, or any other property. You'll still need to go to the Motor Vehicles Department to change a car title or to the County Assessor's Office to change title to land. Another issue that may be dealt with in the marital settlement agreement is spousal support. This can be a very complicated issue because there is no hard and fast rule about whether or when or how much should be awarded. In general, you may need to consult an attorney to help with this because the law gets very complicated. If you think you should get spousal support or your spouse wants you to pay spousal support, that may be something you would want to get a voucher to consult a free attorney about. If a spouse changed their name when they married and wants to change it after the divorce, that request can also be included in the divorce papers. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about parentage cases. There are basically three issues involved in a parentage case. One, paternity. Who is the father of the child? Two, once the father is determined, then the custody of the child has to be established. And three, child support has to be assessed between the two parents. It's important to clarify that paternity cases are concerned solely with the children and not in any way with property. Paternity, who is the recognized biological father of the child, can be established in one of two ways. If paternity is uncontested, the father is usually named on the child's birth certificate. If the father is not named on the birth certificate, he might sign an affidavit stating that he is the child's father. Sometimes, sometimes the father will be named on the birth certificate and also sign an affidavit. If paternity is contested, usually one party asks the court to order DNA testing. Once paternity is established, then custody and child support issues are the same as in divorces. If you own property together, for example, a house or a car, and you're not married, the proper action to divide that property is a separate civil action, contract or real property. You cannot take care of property issues in a parentage case. If you're not married, there's no community. Now let's talk about children. The two main issues regarding children under the age of 18 are custody and child support. It doesn't matter whether the case is a divorce or a parentage case. If you have children together, you will need to come to some agreements about how you're going to take care of them. Those agreements will be written down in a parenting plan. Your case cannot be finalized until you have filed a parenting plan. Let's start by talking about custody. Custody refers to the legal authority to make decisions regarding the child. For example, regarding medical care, education, religion, and residence. Sometimes this is called legal custody. Custody also refers to the legal responsibility for physically taking care of the child. Sometimes this is referred to as physical custody or time sharing. You might have heard the terms joint custody and sole custody. Joint custody means that both parents share the legal authority to make decisions regarding their children as well as the responsibility for taking care of them. Sole custody means that only one parent has that authority and responsibility. In New Mexico, the law presumes that it's in the best interests of the child that both parents share the authority and responsibility for taking care of their children. That means that unless there's a good reason not to, you will share joint custody of your children with their other parent. New Mexico law says that the best interests of the child govern all decisions about them. This seems like common sense, but it's amazing how many parents can convince themselves that what they want is best for their children. Fighting about it, especially where the children can hear, is almost never in the children's best interests. Joint custody does not mean that each parent has to have or is entitled to equal time with the child. It does mean that each parent has an equal say in where the child lives, what school they go to, who their doctors are, what kind of medical care and treatment they receive, what religion they're taught, and what kinds of activities they can participate in. One parent can't change any of these without the other parent's agreement. Your parenting plan will set out all your agreements regarding both legal and physical custody of your children. You can get help with this process by mediating to develop your parenting plan. 
Family Court Services has mediators on staff who are licensed health care professionals with mediation training who know about child development and have experience in helping parents learn how to work together to take care of their children. As your children grow, you and their other parent will have to change your arrangements. If you need help doing this at any time, you can always call Family Court Services for help in mediating a new agreement. What happens if you can't agree on a parenting plan after mediating? The judge will probably order you to a priority consultation to be performed by Family Court Services. Family Court Services assigns a different mediator who's now called a consultant for the purposes of doing the priority consultation. The priority consultation is usually a half day of the consultant's time. The consultant will talk to both parents and maybe the children and then will give the court written recommendations about what to do. If you disagree with the consultant's recommendations, you can file objections to the recommendations and the judge will hold a hearing before deciding what to do. The advisory consultation is more intense. It usually takes all day. The consultant may also include interviews with other persons, for example, teachers, doctors, babysitters, or ask for psychological examinations or drug or alcohol testing. In an advisory consultation, the consultant will write down their recommendations and give them to both parties. If one of you objects, a settlement meeting will be scheduled and see if the three of you can work out an agreement. If you can, then you have a parenting plan. If you can't, the consultant finalizes the recommendations and gives them to the judge. The next thing we need to talk about is child support. Child support is usually determined based on guidelines that are in the statutes. The statutory guidelines are based on the income of each party, the number of children, and other expenses such as medical, educational, work-related daycare, health care insurance expenses, and expenses for transportation and communication when the parents don't live in the same town. Child support is calculated on a child support worksheet. The child support worksheet must be included before the final decree will be entered, even if the amount is zero or the parties have agreed to deviate from the guidelines. Child support worksheets may be completed using online programs like the ones on the Supreme Court's website, or you can get the paper worksheet and fill it out by hand. Whether you are paying or receiving child support, you must keep good records. More cases come up because people don't have good records than for any other reason. Sometimes child support amounts need to be modified. A child turns 18, a parent gets a better paying job or loses a job. There may be many reasons why you might need to change the amount of child support. The important thing to remember is that modification of child support requires a court order. Don't just start paying a different amount. If the two of you ever get into a dispute about how much was paid, even if you agreed to a different amount than the court order, the last court order will be the standard you're held to. In order to modify the amount of child support, you must show a substantial change in circumstances. For example, a big plus or minus 20% increase or decrease in income, loss of a job, or a change in time-sharing arrangements. Maybe your child started out living mostly with you, but as they've grown, he or she wanted to live with the other parent. The New Mexico Child Support Enforcement Division provides many services at no charge. They have full child support services, which include finding absent parents and their employers and or assets, establishing paternity if necessary, and establishing and enforcing child support orders. They also will take care of collecting child support payments from one parent through payroll deductions and paying them to the other parent. Keep in mind that CSED represents the state, not the individual. Call them at 1-800-288-7207 or find them online at www.hsd.state.nm dot us slash csed. CSED has powers that no one else has. For example, they can intercept tax returns for child support. You can obtain a free domestic violence temporary restraining order packet from the DV office in the courthouse. You may also seek counseling, shelter, and help with TRO packets from the Esperanza Shelter for Battered Families. Their phone number is 505-473 5200. There are serious consequences that result from filing a domestic violence accusation, and it should not be taken lightly. You should not lie or make false accusations. 
it's not a way to get the other side in trouble, so they're at a disadvantage in your case. You may be punished for abusing the process if you do that. When you're representing yourself, you must make sure that the court has a current and reliable mailing address and phone number. Once you appear in a case, you'll be notified of hearings or motions by mail only. The address and phone number that appear on the first document with your name on it is the one the court will use. If you move and you miss a hearing because your mail fails to reach you, you may permanently lose important rights. If you move after the first time your name appears on a paper filed with a court, you should file a change of address in the court file. The court or the hearing officer will only mail notices to the address you provide in the court file. If you have a protective order in place and want to keep your address confidential, you must file a request for order to omit so that alternative arrangements can be made for notice. You can get a request for order to omit or a notice of change of address at the court's self-help center or on the court's website. Appear at all scheduled hearings. Be sure to arrive at least 15 minutes before the scheduled time and make sure the judge's assistant, the bailiff, or the court monitor know that you're present. Be sure to allow time to find parking downtown and come through security to get inside the courthouse. If you have requested the court to do something and you do not appear, your request will be dismissed. If the other party is asking for something and you do not appear, they will normally get whatever they're asking for. I can't stress enough how important it is to be prepared. Bring all your documents with you whenever you have a hearing. You must provide the other side with copies of everything you want to show the judge before you get into court. If you or the other party or witnesses need an interpreter to help understand the hearing, you should inform the administrative assistant for the judge or the hearing officer assigned to your case at least 24 hours before the hearing. An interpreter will be provided at no cost for anyone who needs help understanding English. Know what's in your court file. Each party is supposed to give the other one a copy of anything they file, and the court itself will mail things like notices of hearing to both parties. You can look up your file online at www.firstdistrictcourt.gov. Click on Case Lookup. Case Lookup doesn't show you what the documents say, it's just a list of what's been filed. But you can look at the list and compare it with what you have and know if you're missing anything. If you don't have access to a computer, you can call the Self-Help Center. Phone number is 505-455-8146 and ask the staff there to help you. Or you can come to the courthouse. The Self-Help Center staff and the court clerks can give you information from the court file, including your case number, who the assigned judge is, and what pleadings have been filed. You can see what's in your case file by coming to the courthouse and asking at the clerk's office to review the court file. You can get copies from the file for a charge of 35 cents a page. You may not remove anything from the file or add anything to the file without formally filing it with the clerk's office. Be aware that anyone can look in any file. You don't have to be a party to a case to be able to come to the courthouse and look at a file. That means that the information in all the documents you file is not private. So don't put information like your social security number or credit card numbers in any documents you file. Some documents must be notarized. Notaries are available in the Self-Help Center, in the Clerk's Office, and the offices of the judges and hearing officers. You must have a picture identification and you must sign in front of the notary. If you have a document that must be notarized, do not sign it until you're physically in front of the notary and they can see you sign it. Please do not ask notaries to sign for someone who's not present. Remember that having your signature notarized means you swear that you're the person whose signature appears on the document and that to the best of your knowledge the contents of the paper you've signed are true under penalty of perjury. When you come to court, dress with dignity. Do not wear shorts, flip-flops, halter tops, tank tops, baggy jeans, t-shirts with rude messages, sunglasses, or other distracting clothing. Make sure any metal on your clothing, for instance belts or shirts or jackets with metal buttons, can be removed or you won't make it through security. Be clean. 
If you're dressed inappropriately, you may be asked to leave the courtroom and your hearing may be rescheduled. Don't be on time. Be early, at least 15 minutes early. You need to allow time to get through security, find your courtroom, and check in. At your hearing or your trial, you address the judge as your honor. Do not ever try to talk to the judge or a hearing officer in private. He or she can never talk to one party about the case without the other party and a court reporter being present. Each divorce packet and the parentage packet includes a flowchart that tells you the exact procedure you need to follow at each step. As we've mentioned before, every divorce case starts with a petition for dissolution of marriage, and to begin a paternity case, you need to file a petition to establish paternity, determine custody and time sharing, and assess child support. To begin, you must file an original and two copies, the copies are for you and the other party, of your petition. At the court clerk's office, you'll pay a filing fee of $137 in cash, cashier's check, or money order. If you can't afford the filing fee, you can get an application for free process and affidavit of indigency at the self-help center. The forms are also on the court's website. Fill it out completely it asks for all your financial information, and file it before you file the petition. If it's granted, you won't have to pay the filing fee. There is no fee for domestic violence temporary restraining orders. The second step is a service of the petition. The petitioner must have the respondent personally served. That means that after filing your petition, you must assure that a copy is handed to the other party in person. It may be served by anyone who's not a party to the case, who's over 18, and it can be a process server, a sheriff, or anyone else. But you, the petitioner, cannot serve the other party. Someone else must do it. After the respondent is served, then the respondent must file a response to the petition within 30 days of the day they were served. Divorcing parties must develop a parenting plan for taking care of the children and a marital settlement agreement to divide property and debts. Parentage cases are resolved with a finding of paternity and a parenting plan. Any case involving children must also have a child support worksheet. After all the issues are resolved and all the proper documents have been filed, then a final decree is entered. You may have a hearing with the judge and the other party. Do not try to talk to the judge or the hearing officer in private. All your interactions with the judge will be in the formal setting of a courtroom in hearings, which are governed by the rules of civil procedure and the rules of evidence. If you and the other party cannot come to your own agreements about children or property, you may ask the judge to make a decision. You do that by filing a request for hearing. The form to request a hearing can be obtained in the self-help center or on the court's website. If there are violations of court orders or filed agreements, you can file a motion for order to show cause to ask for a hearing so that the judge can decide how to enforce them. In most cases, once a marital settlement agreement is signed and the judge has approved it, it's final and cannot be reopened. The only exceptions are if some property was not addressed in the agreement, or if one party believes the other party intentionally provided erroneous information about the property that became the basis for the agreement about how to divide it. Parenting plans and child support can be modified after they're first entered. To modify or reopen a case, you must file a motion asking the court for what you want. Include a request for hearing with the motion. We hope that you found this DVD useful. If you have questions about the video or require more information, please don't hesitate to contact the Court's Self-Help Center. Thank you for your attention.